Welcome to the Get Offset Podcast. My name is Emily. And I'm Joan Apart. And uh, let's go ahead and get into the gear of the week. I've actually known about this since about NAM, but I am so excited to finally have my hands on it. It is the MT, MT, but MT. <laughs> MTET by Old Blood Noise Endeavors, the MIDI to expression translator. And what this bad boy does is it basically can send MIDI signals to the expression input of a guitar pedal, uh, four of them actually, via MIDI. So you can go into your MIDI controller, you can set uh, channel, the first channel is one through four, and then you set your. Um, the rest of your MIDI controls from there. So it can lock into something specific. It can go between a few things. Uh, it's really in depth. I haven't quite gotten a great hold on it yet. I'm pretty much a MIDI beginner, but having this uh, makes me a little bit less scared to, to get into the world of MIDI. Yeah. Um, I watched when they did the whole launch and everything, uh, the Dan explains it all and everything. And yeah, MTEP so far seems to be a really great way for people to, that know nothing about MIDI to start to get into and dip their feet into it. Um, the way they kind of came across and explained it really simply, simple and easy to go through. Yeah, um, I know that there, I believe Andy Othling made an Ableton plugin. And I don't use Ableton, but uh, I looked at, I downloaded it, I looked at it, I'm like, uh, this, this might, this might be the way, because I don't have a, I don't have like an external MIDI controller for my pedal board, like a Matthews FX Futurist or anything. So I spent some time trying to figure out how to get it from Studio One into, into this guy. And uh, now I'm going to try Ableton because again, I'm just, a, I'm really a beginner. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And, and I really appreciate that Andy went and he did that. Cause again, like prior to this coming out a week before I actually went, because I didn't know anything, I got myself a MIDI box from disaster area, oh, wow. you know? Yeah. So I wanted to sync like the mood, you know, MK2 to like, you know, tempo in my DAW. So with some people like Craig Allen and a few others in the ambient fam, like discord, we kind of like, okay, how can I do this simply? I know nothing about MIDI. Help me out. Help. You're my only hope. <laughs> you know? yeah. So yeah, very simple. I mean, MTET is, just about as simple, easy, straightforward way for anyone to just as a beginner. And again, I always avoided like MIDI. I was just like, what is it? It has MIDI. Don't care. Like that's, I don't, I don't think about like, you know, do I have to have a huge, like steep cost to get into it? You know, I'm not looking to get distracted and learn something new, but yeah. And everything that I've learned so far, you can learn what you want about it. And the way that these boxes operate, it pretty much is pick basically one you want to do and they simply just basically communicate the uh control you know communication with the numbers and you can pretty much get what you want i mean the dark star they're getting like a fifth octaves you're basically able to like get through expression different octaves like that was just blew my mind when i was watching it that night yeah i need to dig into that video i had kind of a busy week and was trying my best but i had other things to focus on it was my my husband's birthday and my <laughs> band sunday crush has a show coming up and uh, rick's actually playing bass with us so uh making sure that he was comfortable on the songs and kind of knew especially the new ones uh kind of took took the bulk of my week but uh, yeah, definitely going to check out Andy's video. Um, and that kind of brings us into the topic, which basically is, is MIDI a modern necessity for guitarists? I'm not a huge MIDI person. I have a few MIDI capable devices. Uh, the Recovery Effects Ghost Writer, um, I've used that to write synth lines in Studio One. So I was able to figure that one out actually, honestly, pretty easily. Uh, and I have, you know, a standard keyboard MIDI controller, um, my fader port eight, which I use to control studio one, that's basically a MIDI controller. Like I have a lot of MIDI devices, uh, programming with them with an app is usually easier for me, but I've never used it in a live situation. I do have MIDI, plenty of MIDI capable guitar pedals. I've just literally never set those up. The closest I ever came was I beta tested the Matthews Effects Futurist. That was a pretty early beta test, and I had to send it back because 
my computer would refuse to recognize it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure that's been ironed out now. And I'm, I was going to talk to Rick uh, Matthews and see if I can, you know, try again. But uh, I, I just, it seems more and more there's almost this divide between guitarists who like unlock MIDI. And these are real mad scientist types, in, in my opinion. Uh, and people who just are avoiding it, like, I want analog pedals or I want digital pedals that just have knobs, you know? Yeah, that's that's about me for the longest time. And I was like, yeah, I don't I don't want to go, you know, mad scientist into the weeds of things. I'm already obviously down the rabbit hole of pedal collecting, but I like the tactile like turning knobs like that. I can hear and I can see in real time. I don't have to program it and have any kind of learning curve to do that in a live situation. I'm like, okay, without knowing too much about, you know, how these set up, like, you know, do we have to set it up in a certain way with presets? How do you dial that in? And what, what are the possible like cons or pitfalls? Like it's so, yeah. so much of an unknown, you know, still, but again, just going into it, it's interesting to see that there are ways in which you can get into mini that maybe if you kind of have your board or a controller as dial in as simply as possible, maybe it is feasible to do in a live setting without again, mad science in it. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the point of, of devices like the MT, MT, MTET, MTET, uh, MTET yes. and like the Matthews FX Futurist and these other boxes where you can't just go in and you can create a set list and just cycle through the settings. And I, I do think that's cool. What's, what's kind mm-hmm. of funny to me is most of the things I have that are technically MIDI devices are simply ways for me to take non-tactile things and make them tactile like the fader port eight like the ghost writer instead of going in and like clicking the notes i can play the monophonically of course on on my guitar translate them into studio one uh lock them into like if my playing's a little messy lock them into where they need to be so i'm literally taking things that should be very digital and making them tactile (laughs) and (laughs) i i think it's really neat that now you can like control multiple expression uh, inputs at a time and they can all be different because that wasn't, hadn't always been the case. Like I think there have been devices where you can control multiple expression pedals at the same time. I think those were mostly um, like tap tempo, basically like tap hmm. the tempo into multiple devices at once. And I feel like that's kind of as far as it's really gotten And also, like, I can't think of a lot of scenarios where you'd want to have all of the expression following that exact same, exact same chain. It just, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But this makes more, this MTET makes, makes more sense in that regard. Yeah, no, I agree. And the whole reason why I was going into MIDI was basically simply for that reason of just connecting everything, all my delays to like tap tempo so that regardless of what I'm using, if I'm tapping things on, they're always, always going to be in sync in my DAW directly to the, you know, beats per minute. And I find that that's at the very least so far, I think that's the best way for me. But going beyond that, the way the MTET has the further expression, um, that's just another new world to start to explore and saying, what if? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. I'm really excited to dig into it more. I apologize to Old Blood Noise Endeavors for not having dug into it more already. <laughs> I <laughs> am uh, very new in that field, in that world. And I'm, I'm trying because I, I do think that... Uh, I wouldn't know. I I don't know if I'd go so far as to calling it like saying something like if you're a guitarist, you really need to learn MIDI. I, I, I think that if you're in music and music production and recording and stuff, it really does behoove you to have a basic understanding of what MIDI is. It unlocks a lot of stuff. Uh, It makes recording a lot easier, especially if you're on your own. Um, And there's a lot of stuff under the umbrella of MIDI that might like, genuinely surprise you so that that's kind of where i stand on it like it's a very good tool to have can you get by without it absolutely you shouldn't be forced to learn midi against your will uh i've often felt forced to use and learn midi against (laughs) against my will but um the more i learn about it the the less kind of weird i feel about i don't know like i think you and i kind of grew up in an age where our first experiences with midi 
were all very cheesy noises. <laughs> and it's gone really, really beyond that. Um, like the sampling that exists now is oh, astounding. Yeah. For, for for decades, it's been the case where pretty much every song you hear on pop radio, the bass is just programmed in. It's, even if it's recorded live, it's often triggering a MIDI sample. No, of course. And the leaps that we've made since then, I'm, even when looking at, you think of Old Blood Noise specifically, um, pedals you've already had, if you are a collector of Old Blood Noise Endeavors pedals, like, you know, I know some people and I kind of am, um, you basically pedals that maybe you've taken off your board. Now you have a new way of experiencing them through MIDI. So it kind of makes something that's old. Also, you can start to explore it in new ways. So I also find that MIDI is giving us, a, the way it is now, a different uh, approach to exploring pedals that obviously that we figured, okay, I'm kind of over this. But no, like now we can explore it and control the expression in ways that we probably haven't heard the pedal behave in a previous way before. And it's fascinating. Yeah, like Andy's pitch stuff. I remember when he was explaining that to us at NAM. it was like, wow, you can do that. You can do that with this. All right, yeah. so I'm going to need to watch that because Andy's a genius. That's yeah. Duh. Like he, he's so creative and also very good at like, uh, uh, putting into words what he wants to do and even coming with up with general solutions for maybe people with a slightly more like engineering background to, to help him figure out. So he's, he's great. Everybody should go, you know, follow yeah. him where you can. Definitely follow him. He's mm -hmm. really great to listen to and, uh, even just a joy to be around. Totally. Well, uh, I would like to give a second to shout out our Patreon. We have a Patreon at patreon.com slash get offset for as little as $5 a month. You get access to our exclusive Discord server. Um, and I want to extend a warm welcome to our newest Patreon supporter, Bradley. Hey, Bradley, I'm going hey, to Bradley. send you a link to the Discord as soon as this is over. Mm -hmm. I don't... <laughs> I forget if I have it set. I thought I had it set up so that people automatically got a join link, but I don't know if that's huh? true. So, uh, Brad, I'm going to send Bradley. I'm going to send that uh, your way as soon as we are we are done recording. Um, so, thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. I really appreciate you. And yeah. if you're watching this in the premiere and you want to support us, Patreon supporter or not, uh, you can drop us a super chat or later you can say thanks down below. And if you're listening to this podcast on Spotify, thank you. Uh, we have ads on Spotify and they're actually, they have a much better CPM than, uh, or RPM than YouTube ads does. Sorry, YouTube, uh, your ad revenue has gone down on every channel I've spoken to. Even if they're getting more listeners, their revenue per basically 1000 viewers is, uh, in the garbage, but Spotify mm. is like, two to three times what YouTube is, is paying creators. So big thanks to everybody who listens on Spotify. It's actually kind of absurd to me that Spotify pays better for podcasts than they do for music. That's wild. It's so stupid, but it's true. Uh, no. Might as well use it to my advantage. Um, I want to shout out merch really quickly. If you haven't noticed the Get Offset logo change, big shout out to my singer, Jenna Pyle for creating that awesome new logo. That being said, older logo merch is now on sale. <laughs> <laughs> and if you really are desperate to get uh, a shirt with a new logo on it, that's also available pretty much at cost. Uh, however, <laughs> I'm going to get a transparent PNG of that. So right now it's uh, kind of a block inlay sort of situation to put it in terms that guitarists understand. I still think it's a really cool shirt, but know uh, that that's going to be cheaper because it's just kind of like a different product. I, when I get the, the full transparent PNG logo, those shirts are going to be like a normal shirt price. So get them now. Get, 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 get it, get it now. <laughs> to save a few bones. No, Thank she really did a great job. The design is really fun. I love it. Yeah. And if you're on our Patreon, uh, when that new design comes out, I will be giving you a coupon code. Yes. So safe, yeah, safe, safe. yeah, and of course, like, comment, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. That's the best way to support the channel. Brands really favor channels with 
larger YouTube subscribers. So that's my spiel. <laughs> Get it out of the way of the 15 minute mark. And uh, that's all I've got. And also go follow Joe at uh, Pedal Playhouse. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk about some current events. I did a video on this last week, but it would appear that Dave Grohl may have leaked his signature uh, epiphone. There is some dispute about that. But basically, he, Dave Grohl had a signature dip Gibson, the DG335. It yeah. came out twice in very, very limited batches. There literally aren't any on Reverb last time I checked. I don't know if you can buy one anywhere right now. But it's a it's it's modeled after the Trini Lopez style, so it has the diamond shaped f holes and kind of a Firebird esque headstock. And uh, some eagle eyed Foo Fighters fans saw on uh, NME posted a photo. Dave was playing guitar; it looked like his, but the headstock said Epiphone. Bum, bum, bum. This may be his upcoming signature guitar. It also could be someone in the comments of my first YouTube video said that there were Epiphone Trini Lopez's. I have not fact checked that. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Epiphone I don't... Trini. Did you look that up? I look earlier when I was looking around for Trini Lopez, I was not seeing Epiphone. I was seeing Gibson uh, for the most part. And of course, seeing how their range of pricing went from like, you know, seven grand and above. So, I mean, those are the only ones I was seeing appearing. I did not see an Epiphone unless they're so obscure that maybe like five were made. I didn't see unless, you know. And that would be even more expensive. But yeah, yeah I just did a quick search on YouTube and Google. I mean, eBay and Google. Nothing, nothing on your Epiphone for uh, for that. But then Andy, uh, for the Guitar Geek, Andy, he colorized it somehow, and he says that it's gold. I I don't know how accurate colorization AI colorization is or whatever he did on mm -hmm. black and white images. Yeah, I, I just think that's that seems unlikely. But if it were gold, I'd, I'd be stoked. I'd love to see it in gold and you, blue. You know. You you know me in blue, so that's why I was just like, if it's blue, you know, um, I'm in danger. <laughs> but he typically likes blue, yeah. I like gold. Mm -hmm. I like options. Of course. Um, so people have been talking about how much it's going to cost. I forgot that Epiphone does have some like $1,800 level guitars. I hope this isn't one of them. I hope this is more in line with like the Emily Wolf signature, which I think falls in the six to eight hundred dollar category. That would be nice. That uh, really, really would would be nice. So check out that video on the channel. It's from last week. You'll probably see more videos like that on the channel coming up. I, I really enjoy that little format. It's something I can turn around pretty quickly. So uh, keep keep your eyes peeled for more of those. Cool. So you posted, you submitted a few news articles. Uh, do you want to start with the Sophie Lloyd or the Fender John 5? Well, we can go with the Sophie Lloyd from uh, Kiesel. Uh, I actually was looking around and I really did like what I was seeing that Kiesel was making a, you know, signature guitar model with Sophie Lloyd. And they are so beautiful. <laughs> Um, the way like it even has the bevel and it has like a almost like flame chrome, you know, accent. Uh, it's very much kind of like more of a shredder guitar. Um, but again, they still made it customizable. Unlike, you know, uh, you think Nita Strauss or anyone, whatever the models were like, that's the format that came in. Um, Sophie and of course, you know, Kiesel was thinking, Hey, well, you know, we still like, just like other people to be able to make a guitar besides just how it looks to give more several options and even further it's fully customizable if people want to put one of the you know uh sustainer maniac you know uh on it uh then they could that thing was actually 
pretty cool because you can bring a note and the thing will sustain for days. But <laughs> that's, a, that's, important, that's important in yes. some genres of music. <laughs> yes, there is. There's a kill switch, which is pretty great. And that was another thing that we'll talk about, of course, in the John 5. We're seeing more, I think, kill switches, you know, little buttons that we, we have on guitars that we're seeing more of. And those are pretty fun. I've seen Buckethead when I went to go see him live. It's one of the things that he does where he'll pass his guitar kind of like in his hands over the crowd and everyone will hit the, like, you know, the kill switch. <laughs> yeah, um, so, I think Tom Morello is the first guitarist enough. I saw really, really use that. But yeah, it's exciting to see another signature guitar from a woman. This one is $2,700 is the base price. So I yeah. mean, it's a nice guitar. It comes in three colors. Uh, it's based on the bolt-on Aries from, from uh, Kiesel. So yeah, it's a cool guitar. And what Reverb taught us is that uh, it's hard to keep guitars, signature guitars uh, from women guitarists in, in stock. Those sell really, really well. So I think Sophie's a great guitarist, and I hope yeah. this sells really, really well. It's obviously just a really high-end shredder of an axe. Oh, yeah. And, and of course, it comes in blue. So, you know, I was already like, yes. I like the purple <laughs> myself. Uh, so that kind of brings us into Fender's John 5 uh, that's from Ghost, uh, signature Telecaster, and you like you like this one a lot more than than I do. You're a Ghost fan. <laughs> Well, I mean, the name the name of the Telecaster, I guess they named it was Ghost. So I also like Ghosties in general. And of course, the band Ghost. So yeah, I guess it's all like degrees of separation. <laughs> um, but just overall, the look of the guitar, all, you know, everything being completely white, the chrome, uh, you know, the pick guard stretching into, of course, where the knob and again, the kill switches, the white and the red uh, pairing, even like down to the Fender logo being like the red rather than the stereotypical kind uh, of gold even the nut, the I guess yeah. washers around the tuning machines, mm -hmm. the binding, binding. The I loathe colored humbuckers. <laughs> like I don't like humbuckers that come in bright colors. I I know you really like this. I think it's I think it's hideous. <laughs> I think this is a hideous guitar. Um, it's not for me. Like if somebody sent this to me to play, I would send it. I'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if it was white and blue, you know, maybe like we're talking. I think it's great because it's different than typically a lot of things that they oh, have. Oh, it's kind definitely of done. differently different. Yes. <laughs> definitely different. It looks like it's supposed to, but it's not. Like I guess that. it's supposed to look like that. Oh uh, no, I like I. I'm happy for you. It's three thousand dollars. It's a signature, yeah. So I mean, I uh, guess with this one of all the options and everything, but yeah, it's I mean, sold the, out. The her, the her signature isn't that expensive. It's sold out. They probably didn't make a ton of them. The her yeah. signatures are thirteen fifty, and let me see who's this. Let me, let me look at signature guitars. I don't know who has the They're most already affordable going. Fender signature. Yeah, that since they sold out, they're already going like on reverb for like pretty much close to six k, even though That's they sold at like three. It's insane. Stupid. <laughs> Steve Lacey. Let's see how much Steve Lacey's Strat is. Fourteen hundred dollars. Fourteen hundred dollars. Like. It's the name. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's half the price. <laughs> it's half the price of the John 5. I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm glad you like it. I I wouldn't I wouldn't touch that one personally. <laughs> no, affordability, yeah, no, that keeps me away from things like that. But I was like, I can appreciate the I mean, I like the aesthetic of it at least. And uh, you know, that's that's pretty much kind of like where it ends and begins, I guess. Yeah, three K and I was like, you won't see me with that. <laughs> no. No. This week's episode of Get Offset is brought to you by Moog Music. Moog instruments continue to inspire artists and listeners around the world. As music technology continues to evolve, the company and its employee owners carry on Bob Moog's devotion to creating innovative tools designed for the musician. Moog Music's latest venture is a reimagining of some of its most influential analog instruments of the past for today's audio production workflow. The Moger Foger FX plugins are compatible across all major DAWs on Windows and Mac OS, making the Moog sound more accessible than ever. 
I use the MF108 Cluster Flux, a flexible processor that can modulate between chorus, flanging, and vibrato in the background track you're listening to right now. I love this effect. It's probably the most used of the plugins uh, for me personally. I even use it in a recent recording project. Learn more about the Mografoger FX plugins by clicking the link in the video or podcast description or by visiting software.mogmusic.com. That's software.moggmusic.com. All right. Welcome back. Thanks again to Moog. This one, uh, this week we're doing a slightly different game hosted by Jesse of Rude Tech. I'm a big fan of Jesse's products. Uh, he's got a great uh, three tri-voiced muff pedal um, that I have a demo for. Just go check that out. And um, yeah, so let's play the game. It is Guess the Guitarist Based on the Gear. Ooh, I'm, I, I'm um, nervous. <laughs> I'm really nervous. I, I yeah. told him... Well, I told everybody doing this, and you told him as well. It has to be someone we will probably, like, we we have the ability to know, like, please don't pick, please don't pick, like, something too obscure. (laughs) Oh, that would make it hard. All right. Are you ready? Yep. Three, two, one, go. Hey, it's Jesse. All right, I've got a game for you. Pick the player based on the gear. So... Let's do an easy one. Let's do a warm up. Are you ready? Get limber, get loose. Here we go. Epiphone Casino. Vox AC30. And then if we're doing some effects, uh, maybe a Maestro Fuzz Tone or a Dallas Arbiter Fuzz Face, the England one, the silver one. All right. Um, there are some hints in there. The the two the two effects are very very 1960s. The Vox is very British. I have a I have a guess. Do you have a guess? Uh, my guess is going to be so wild, but probably off the mark. But I'll go with it anyway when you're ready. Um, I don't think it's Keith Richards. I think it's George Harrison. Okay. Okay. What's your guess? I was thinking some. Thing like Brian May, but I don't think that's right. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I don't think he's ever really played anything but the Red Special. Yeah. So let's uh, see who's right. All answers in. I'm ready. No. It's George Harrison. See? Hey! <laughs> that's easy. That's fun. We're loose. We're limber. We're ready to go. All right. Here's a tougher one Ibanez Seven String. Maybe a Yamaha. Maybe a PRS. But when I'm thinking of this player, I'm thinking of an Ibanez seven string, um, an EVH amp, Ernie Ball strings. I realize this could be a lot of people, right? So I'm trying to I'm trying to do it based on ads that you would have seen this person endorsing in magazines or something. But think about it, and if you don't get it, I have a bonus hint for you. I'm going to wait for the bonus hint. Me too. Come on, Jesse. We're done? Our votes are in? No, I need the bonus hint. Now I'm afraid. (laughs) Oh, my God. All right. I have no, no godly (laughs) idea. I'm going to say Steve Vai. I don't know. (laughs) I would think he would have had the gem, though. Like something like that. Yeah, that's why I'm like not thinking that but with context it makes me kind of think i don't know because i was thinking like maybe pete thorne i was like no not that either like who and i was also thinking steve Vai too but <laughs> i'm sure oh i'm God. sure i'm wrong i have no idea if and, you play seven strings you're just out of my out of my element <laughs> yeah completely out of my element as well and i mean anybody else that dresses i guess interesting enough but he plays his telecaster that's jump five so uh i mean i would again i would take a wild guess and probably like shit i'd have i'd have to go with the same kind of i even though i know guess damn just <laughs> um, commit. i'm just i'm just gonna i'm just gonna commit with steve Vai, even though right. i just don't i don't think it's that i don't think all. we're right i don't think we're no, right no i don't think so either all right here's the bonus hint fuck white face paint and some kooky contacts oh it's the guy from Limp Biscuit. 
Ah, uh, okay. It was West Borland. It's West Borland. It was so bad with this. Right? West Borland. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> Thank you for the bonus hits, Jesse. <laughs> okay, and that's my next game that I want to play is West Borland, overrated or underrated? Um, there's a lot of people who like to talk about him and be like, oh man, did you know he actually like really likes really cool music and plays really cool music. I haven't really listened to any of the bands, but I keep hearing from people that they meet him and he's just a super nice guy and, um, you know, doesn't like get messed up and party. He's just like really all about guitar and gear and stuff and listens to cool music. I don't know if any of that's true though, but I don't know. What do you think? West Borland overrated or underrated? I'm going to say he's underrated. Mm. I, I think that the Limp Bizkit sound is really defined by his playing. And I'm going to go ahead and say West Borland's underrated. Not for me. I don't think he's for me, but I think he's a very functional yeah. guitarist. <laughs> what do you think? I, I think he's underrated. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jesse, for sponsoring and I, I mean, I guess hosting, contributing, uh, yes, contributing <laughs> to this week's episode, hosting this week's game. If you would like to participate in the in one of these games, um, yes. first dibs goes to our Patreon supporters and a few of our friends, builders, etc. So check us out. Check out the Patreon, and uh, you could see yourself. In an episode on an episode of Get Offset. Yes, and throwing us curveballs in ways that we have to, on our feet, guess, you know, obviously what the answers or trivia or things are, which is a lot of fun if you're trying to throw us a loop. Totally. <laughs> All right. So now Joe's going to take a take a sidestep for a second. She'll be back. I, really, I feel like last week I didn't specify she'd be back, but... Um, <laughs> This week, we have a guest for a small interview segment, Hillary B. Jones, talking about some pretty important social elements. I don't know why I said that. Just fucking watch the interview, Jesus. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm here with Hillary B. Jones of the Midriff Podcast. How are you doing, Hillary? I am doing all right. How are you? Good, good. You know, I know I've been on your podcast, but I don't think you've ever been on Get Offset. It's... A pleasure. <laughs> yeah, the pleasure is all mine. The honor <laughs> is all ours collectively. Um, but for those who don't know, Hillary has been in the gear space for years. And a lot of what she does is, uh, how would you explain it actually? Because I would like to know how you describe what you do. Yeah. I mean, I would say I do consulting around workplace culture um, and DEI for music companies. I do it for other folks as well, but that's sort of my focus area because that's where my heart is. Nice, nice. Yeah. I know you've worked with uh, Earthquaker and Chase Bliss, among others, um, and you've even done some studies, some of, some of your own research and polls, it sounds like. It's true. Yeah, I did uh, the Gender and Music Gear Experience Report, um, which was a survey of about a thousand musicians, um, which came out last year, which was very exciting. And um, oh. yeah, there's it's, you know, if you want a good read, a nice white paper for your uh, f fun times, uh, you can check it out. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've gone through that, but a thousand is a lot of participants. That's huge. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, um, you know, if you want to read it, there's a short version and then you can read like a two page version or you can read a 28 page version. Pick your poison. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much time you have. It sounds like a great beach read. That's right. I me. mean, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Well, uh, one thing that you've done recently is you kind of asked, the, your, I assume yourself and then the world, why aren't <laughs> there more moms in touring bands? And like, how many are there? Because I, I can't really think of a lot of bands that have, you know, like you said, more than one mother in them mm -hmm. who go on tour. Yeah. And it's, I, you can name a lot of bands like that with, with dads and it, it seems like just because when I was thinking about it I was like oh all of the all, all of my examples are very very famous people like totally. pay, playing big amphitheaters like Marin Morris and people like that yeah yeah it's people who are have enough money to like bring a nanny on tour with them and are getting compensated well and you know yeah, have a lot of support and anybody beyond that, it's like the the likelihood of that happening is pretty low if you're not like Beyonce or whatever. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. did you ever find any any good examples? Yeah. Uh, well, the people I had an I had about six that I so I put it out to my personal like Facebook page, and I got about six examples, um, which were this queen, our native daughters, spires that in the sunset rise, psychic TV, Waylon Jennings, and all girl summer fun band. Um, and there <laughs> were others. Once I posted this on Instagram, more people came up with a few others, but it was still pretty minimal or it was like really big bands or it was like just one mom, you know? So, or, yeah. you know, another thing that came up a lot was like couples that would go on tour as like couple bands, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that I get, I mean, it's, it's one hotel room. Yeah. It's you and the kids and, and the partner. Slightly more slash slash slightly less complicated, I guess, because you have to find you definitely have to find somebody during the actual performance. But like other than that, you're you're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, have your partner yeah, come sure. with you and like take care of the kid while you're performing. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, or you could do that, but I don't think a lot of people do. No, uh, I like, just last year, I went on on tour with uh, three dads Ooh. <laughs> and then the other woman and I are obviously not mothers. <laughs> so it's like three, three dudes, th- three dudes with kids and then two non mother women. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was interesting cause I thought about it cause I've, yeah, I've been out playing more lately. I've been out to more shows lately and some of the bands that I've seen lately are bands that like have been around a long time and now are, you know, older and they are able to, they're, they're like bands with women in, in them that are able to go out and tour. And I, I hadn't even thought about it, but then I was like going through who was in the bands and I was like, Oh, actually none of these people are moms. <laughs> none of them. Yeah. Uh, and then I was like, Oh, that's, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> Just puts a, puts a hitch in it. And I mean, there's so many different yeah. reasons for that. I mean, frankly, playing music is probably one of the reasons I don't have kids, if I'm being completely honest with myself. And I know it's not possible. I just know how exactly how much harder it would be. And I keep thinking, like, if my life were even a little bit harder, I just don't think I'd be able to function in any way, shape or form. I'd have to drop so much. And that's having a partner who's incredibly supportive and, you know, also doesn't really want kids, but would be a great dad. Right. Yeah. And that's another piece of this, too, is like you know, thinking about that, it doesn't, you know, when you're trying to figure out who those people are, it doesn't take into account the people who are like, oh yeah, I I might have kids if I weren't doing this particular job or if I wasn't playing music. Like there's, that's a whole piece. And I think that's a calculation for a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a bummer that you have to choose because the truth is just childcare in this country. Kids, kids are more expensive in this country than other developed nations Yeah, from birthing them to raising them Yeah, to like, sending them off into the world when they're adults. It's all a lot more expensive here than pretty much anywhere else that's extremely developed. Yeah. It's like, I think the average childcare costs is about $13,000 per year. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's average. Yeah. And that, uh, and I, and C- I, I live in Seattle right. and it's a lot, it's like, it's, it's a whole salary for, exactly. for someone like me. Right. Or at least half my salary every month would be going to, you know, somebody somebody washing the kid for eight hours a day. Yeah. And so if somebody's making, you know, minimum wage, like that's a calculation that people do. And they're like, well, I guess I'm not going to be working. You know, like that's just, that's a calculation that people have yeah. to figure out. Mm-hmm. And it's tough because usually that person who stops working is the mom. Mm-hmm. And if you don't work for a couple of years, you risk you know, you're putting this weird stop in your career where it may never get back to where it would have been. You lose a lot of momentum. Uh, You have a big gap in your resume. If you're working, if you're a musician, the momentum thing is a lot bigger. It's like, well, where the hell have you been for the past five years? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I had to wait till my kid was old enough to go to preschool. Totally. Yeah. No. And, and, and I do think there are some situations where it's like, you know, like the, the dad who is a musician who has like can work in the evenings and then like they can switch off or whatever. So the dad takes care of the kid during the day and they can, then some people do it that way. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting because it, it affects people as like professional musicians, hobbyists, and then people actually working in the music year industry in particular in slightly different ways, but the impact is not dissimilar. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't even know how many more mothers there are in like, 
you think about people who work live events, mm-hmm, for example. Because right. I know I also I've worked in live events for a number of years, and I knew several women who worked there. I didn't know a ton with with kids. I yeah. knew a few. I knew a security guard who had a daughter, mm-hmm. um, and I think that was God. That really that really might have been been it. I mean. I've worked with brands who have like do vendor and like event stuff, but that's like a couple weekends a year. It's not like I'm spending all year planning this event. And then when I do the event, it's like a week long thing for a three day festival because you have to get there early. You got to, you know, mark things down. You got to set things up and you got to tear things down. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a a lot. It's a lot to ask of anybody. Yeah. Not everybody has, you know, parents, we move more away Mm -hmm. from home now than we, really ever have right so the likelihood of having like grandparents or parents who can watch the kid or eat are even willing to yeah i mean there are plenty of grandparents out there who are like you know i raise my kids i don't want to <laughs> raise my grandkid <laughs> mm-hmm. like, i love my grandkid but i don't want like i can't have them yeah we're not uh, hanging this out many all the hours time yeah 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 no yeah totally um, yeah, so there's so many calculations involved with that, but I think the issue, I think <laughs> to me, that thought experiment around like how many people are actually out there doing this was the thing that really clicked it, clicked in for me because it just was so hard to come up with any names at all. Whereas like for men, you know, like that's just not the case. And so I think that that demonstrates if anything, like the ways that this shows up for folks, like even if you are taking into consideration like the gender pay gap or, you know, like whatever else like, you know, might be at, at play. Um, I think that the fact that people just aren't there or you can't think of anybody is probably the biggest example of that. Yeah. I mean, the bands that you named are all much smaller mm-hmm. indie bands too. Yeah. And then the ones that I can think of outside of that are very famous and can afford, you know, nannies essentially. Right. I don't, I can't think of anyone like in the middle there. Like I can't think of anybody who would play like the Bowery Ballroom Mm -hmm, or the Neptune who has more than one mom in the band. Yeah. And that mom is probably the lead singer and the least like replaceable person in the whole group. Yeah. And I know it it is hard for dads too. And I, I, I totally get that. And I know a lot of dads do put their music career on hold as well, um, which is a bummer, but it's, you know, just by numbers, I think that's that's an issue for sure. All parents make sacrifices if you're, you know, a good parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. uh, hopefully people are doing what they need to do. Um, I would hope that people are able to both do their own hobbies if they're able to. Um, but, you know, mm-hmm. making sure that it's equitable. Yeah, that, that's what's key. And that's just what's hard. And I know people are going to come in and say, you know, women who have kids are just less likely to play music and like that, like implying that there's not a causation in there that's mm-hmm. just a correlation or it kind of goes the opposite way but like you said there's probably more women than would maybe even admit that they'd be more likely to have kids if if it were more feasible to do so and maintain their careers in music totally yeah yeah, yeah. that's the next survey <laughs> <laughs> so so what do you think have you because i know that you've like identified the problem mm-hmm. or like the kind of vibe yes uh what would what would be like what do, what do we think would be like solutions because that's a completely different question i mean mm-hmm. obviously if child care was more affordable in this country if it was more affordable to have kids yeah. more women would be able to especially women i should say would be able to stay in their careers mm-hmm. um no matter what that career is yeah. I mean, obviously, and, and I think it depends on what you're talking specifically about, like musicians or people who are hobbyists versus like professional musicians versus hobbyists versus like people in the industry more broadly. Um, I think that having more like matinee shows would be helpful mm. potentially. Um, I know that's not the solution for everyone, but that could be helpful. Um, it could be, you know, I think in general, like recognizing all of the other things that are keeping people from playing. So that could be like harassment policies, uh, providing paid flexible leave, um, you know, creating better structures within the like music industry to support artists generally. Right. Like, um, so that they're, they're having that like longer term support and it's not so like catch as catch can, you know what I mean? Um, Mm -hmm. and that would help everyone. Like a lot of the policies, that you would come up with are things that would legitimately be beneficial to everyone. Um, 
and that's just how it works, right? So yeah, healthcare benefits, like anything, any of that, like it's going to keep people in this situation where they're able to keep their roles. Um, you know, and I think having more, I think having more nannies available for these types of things, right? Like, uh, perhaps there are venues that have like childcare available. Like, I know that sounds ridiculous saying it out loud, but like, no, there's lots of employers that yeah. have child care available. Yeah. Like there's Dick's Burgers, a fast food joint in mm. Seattle, and they they help help parents pay for child care while they're working. Mm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and that I feel like having that type of support is is super useful um, because people yeah. then have that flexibility that they might not otherwise have. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it, it's interesting to think about. Like we have organizations like Music Cares, which mm-hmm. helps with health related issues. Yeah. We have things like the Roadie Clinic that takes uh, a lot of the issues that roadies have from health and mental health to financial health yep. and beyond. Um, we don't really have anything like that for parents who are musicians. And it's not really baked into the idea of any kind of health care or any kind yeah. of other care. I mean, ultimately, what I, I see is people are not really incentivized to have kids um and people who do have kids it's very much a you're on your own thing that was your decision because mm-hmm. it's always a decision right uh-huh yeah always yeah. a conscious decision <clears throat> um and so it would be it would be good if it was just easier to do something that's generally considered good for society and that's to have children and art is also generally considered to be yeah. good for society yeah well and i think too like having uh having more supports for uh for dads as well creates a space where the, where dads can like take time off um as well to be a part of like helping support household helping their kids like being more involved and then that allow, allows moms in obviously a heterosexual cisgender couple to um you know, to be able to be a, a part of things. Um, so, every, yeah. so there's more equity across the board because men oftentimes have yeah. this, this situation where there's an, they're expected to not be there um, or not be as present or not be as responsible. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, totally. I mean, all of these solutions are solutions for parents, mm-hmm. not yes. mothers specifically. Uh, there, There's a lot, obviously a lot more going on in terms of like, society of why it is generally the mothers who take on the the bulk of the child care that's mm-hmm. just how it's been for a very long time yes <laughs> a very very long time i mean you think about like in the 60s men weren't even at like the birthing of their children and stuff like yeah <laughs> I, society is changing you know uh but uh, i think it could become a little bit more equitable a yeah. little bit more quickly. Um, yeah. Generally speaking. Thinking about like, yeah, I mean, thinking about childcare and, and, and I think that, you know, uh, thinking about it as a community effort, right. So like, you know, where can, where can families and friends and everybody come together? And I think like, um, some people have that figured out, other people's don't, uh, other people don't. And I think it's just a matter of like normalizing that a little bit too. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Well, uh, that's about time for us. Thank you so much, Hillary. Can you give a little rundown of where people can find you and your content? Sure. Um, you can find me at Midriff Podcast on Instagram or at HillaryBJones.com. Nice. Well, thank you again. And uh, let's get back to the rest of the show. Thanks again to Hillary. Uh, if you know of any like touring mid-level indie-esque bands that have more than one mom in it, let us know in the comments. Very, very curious. Uh, I literally couldn't think of any, but also I don't really know the personal lives of a ton of, of people. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, last week, Joe asked us a trivia question. Joe, do you want to repeat that question? Yes, yes, I will. Before the Bigsby, what was the mechanical vibrato system in use and what electric guitar was it installed on? All right. So we pose this question to me, to the listeners. Nobody really specified a model or a name of a a vibrato, but the general agreement was that it was a Rickenbacker. So I think it was on a Rickenbacker guitar. I don't think it was the Palm vibrato unit. I think there was a vibrato unit 
that bent the strings from side to side and couldn't stay in tune. And I just, for the life of me, have no idea what it was called, nor which guitar it was on other than John Lennon used one. Okay, well, in answering one half of the <laughs> trivia, you all got it right with it being installed on a Rickermacher. But what it actually was is the Vibrola. Mm. It is a kind of like a motorized version that had knobs and it controlled the speed and volume, but it actually was a system that kind of created a tremolo to on the strings. It was called a Vibrola Spanish guitar basically on the that is the name of the rickenbacker but it's called a vibrola v-i-b dash rola and the reason why of course this didn't you know translate beyond you know where it went is because of course it's too cumbersome and of course it has internal motors and parts to probably hard to repair so that's the vibrola is that true it was in it was basically look at the vibrola spanish guitar when did that Rick come out? Because I thought that there was a hand-operated vibrato. What year? Mm, yeah. This one's motorized. That's very weird thing to do for that old. Yeah, no, that's what I said. Of course, they didn't go that route going after that. Like that's not going to be feasible in any sense. No, that's weird. Uh, so <laughs> probably a great idea to not not do that anymore. <laughs> So I only got half right. Weird. Bummer. Half right. All right. Well, mine's not as hard. <laughs> <laughs> you said a hard one. <laughs> I know, but I, I think that mine will still be surprising. <laughs> uh, so this week, Squire came out with a new bunch of Paranormal series guitars. Um, and in honor of that, my trivia question is, and just don't look this one up. Don't look it up. It's just, just guess what year was squire founded <laughs> and what did they originally make i know it's not as hard i didn't pick a hard one <laughs> <laughs> it's still gonna be hard for me <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> all right so what year was squire founded and what were their original products were they guitars i don't uh, know were they uh frets I don't know. Was it cars? Who knows? Let's uh, leave your guesses in the comments on the YouTube, or if you're listening on Spotify, uh, just drop that in the message. Last week, I tried to make a poll, and I didn't even include the correct answer, obviously. So, oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> it happens. It happens. All right. Well, still a few uh, seconds to drop in a super chat if you want to. Thank you to everybody who does that. Thank you so much. Um, Patreon at patreon.com slash get offset merch at get offset podcast.com slash shop. New episodes on Tuesdays. Blah, 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 blah. Thanks for watching Nothing slash thanks. listening. <laughs> thanks for understanding. Until next time, my name is Emily. I'm Joan of Hart. Goodbye. Be seeing you. <laughs>